Today we continue our read through the New Testament. And if you're visiting with us or haven't joined us on that journey yet, uh, we are uh, doing a journey that takes us five chapters a week. And through the year, we will end up reading the whole New Testament together. And uh, we would love to have you join us on that journey. And if you haven't started yet, now is the time because uh, this week we start Luke 2 and we continue in through Luke. And so it's a great place to kind of hop on board and, and join this journey with us. As we look at the first few chapters in Luke, ones that caught my attention were Luke 5. And because it's Jesus beginning to call his disciples, and this isn't the first time that we've read this, but it, it caught my attention because I think in some way we all are followers and we all have people following us. And so we have something that comes to mind when we hear the word follow or followers, right? And so for me, one of the things that comes to mind is this song. It might not be that, but it might be a yellow brick road, right? So we all have images or things that pop into our head when we talk about following or leading people. Well, Jesus, he uses these words, follow me, right? And typically when we use those words, we have some sort of selfish gain that goes with it, some, some uh, selfish ambition, right? So you you ask someone to follow you so that you can use their strengths so that you can get ahead. Or maybe you jump on board with an idea simply because you can run with it a little bit more on your own if you get the concept. And there's other things like maybe going home instead of going out to recess and leading your class astray, right? There are things that we we do that may not come as like a conscious thought, but it's there. It's this, this self-seeking, this self-searching idea of having the people around you there so that you can gain from them. But that's not where Jesus went as he called his disciples and said, follow me. And we can see that even if we look at the word follow. And if you look at that and you dive into its origin, it's Greek, the new... New Testament is written in Greek, and so if we dive into that Greek word, we see that it, it's an alpha path, right? It's, it's the first path, the only path. And, and we, we get a little bit better understanding of reading, uh, he will make your path straight. Right? This is my confirmation verse, and we know that oftentimes our, our paths are wide and varied, right? Um, you, you may have uh, eight colleges that you've gone to instead of the one that you thought you'd be at for four years. You may have seven different careers that you've been a part of instead of the one you thought you would really advance in. Our paths don't always look straight. But if we, if we listen to Jesus and say, and he says, follow me, we see that in following him, he's saying, my love and forgiveness are there for you no matter what. And that is going to be a corrective measure in your path. And so following me means that, yes, your, your, your actual path may be wide and varied, but that radical message of love and forgiveness will be straight in your life and will be an anchor that you can hold on to as you go. And so we see Jesus, even in his words, beginning to set the stage for something that's coming that's a little bit different. And so Jesus says to his disciples, follow me, or you'll become fishers of men or people, right? And, and so he calls these people who uh, are working class people, 
fishermen who are out with their nets, right? So these are, are guys who are on the third shift, who smell like fish and sweat, who have labored through the night only to come up failing. They're having to go in and wash their nets with nothing there. They can't feed their families. They can't sell it. They failed. And then you have Levi, who is a tax collector. Did you catch that uh, there are categories of sinners for the Pharisees? There are tax collectors and sinners. And tax collectors are kind of seen as the worst of the worst because they're, they're hated by uh, the Roman government because they're, they may or may not give as much as they should, but they're also hated by their own people because they're getting taxes to give to Rome. And so they're, they're kind of in the middle and no one really likes them. So the Pharisees see them in a different category. Someone who has made more mistakes than anyone else. But Jesus comes to these people and he says, follow me. And it's amazing that if we look at the Gospels and we see Jesus working with these 12 men, we see that he does some magnificent things. But through that, but through that, he takes the time to come to them, right? He has come to the waterfront. He has come to the marketplace and he says, follow me. And as he does that, he teaches them. He walks alongside them and says, hey, this message of love and forgiveness that I'm sharing, that's for you too. It's a message that goes into their lives. It comes into our lives. And then we see them gathered together. That upper room that we hear about in the Gospels as they had their last supper together and that they keep on going back to, there's a reason. It's because that's where they found community. That's where they found fellowship. That is where God was with them together so they could lean on each other, so they could hold each other up. And then he sends them into the world and says, go, go and share this message with everyone you see. Regardless of who they are, where they've been, well, I want them to know. And so I'm going to send you uh, into the world. So we see this model of discipleship that Jesus had as he, he says, follow me to his disciples. He doesn't say, step where I step and go where I go. He says, learn from me, learn from one another, and take that into the world to make it a better place with my love and my forgiveness. Well, I don't know how all of you learn. We all learn in different ways. But one of the ways that I learn is to put things to shapes, right? So if you've sat down with me for coffee or lunch maybe, I may have even drawn a triangle out for you on a napkin. Because when I think of Jesus and how he discipled the men who were following him, I think of a triangle, and our model, our path here at St. Michael for discipleship follows that. And as we look at that triangle, we see that it starts with becoming more like Jesus. We know that he's come to us, right? And we know that in this journey of reading through the New Testament, we can ask the question, how is God speaking into your life? Because he comes to us in his word as we study, as we pray, as we uh, spend time in worship. And he does. He speaks into our lives in different ways. Uh, he speaks to us all individually. And so we can ask that question, how is God speaking into you today? And then we have people to share that with as we look at belonging to the body of believers. Seeing the people in the room or the people online as brothers and sisters in Christ allows us to know that we have people on our side. That we can lean into or we can lift up depending on what the case may be. That we have people who are championing us simply because we're loved and forgiven children of God. 
And so we're brothers and sisters in Christ in that way. And then we see that Jesus sent his disciples out by two to go and bless the world. And then they go and they start some marvelous things after he ascends into heaven. And what we see in that is that he has called us to share that love and forgiveness with the world, to go bless the world by being witnesses to what, what his story has meant for us so that we can share it and it can mean something for the people around us too. And we would love to see this as an equilateral triangle. All sides are equal and we, we have this, this shape that's kind of perfect, right? Well, we all live in different seasons. We all have different things happening in our lives. And so my question for you this morning is, what does your triangle look like? It may look like a circle. And you scratch your head and you say, I, I don't even know what he's talking about. I understand the word love and I understand the word forgiveness, but I don't know in the context of where I'm at in my life and in my season what that means. Well, that's what our Christian Foundations class is all about, is helping build some of those foundational pieces, and that's okay. Or you may have a, a really good connection with reading the word and being in prayer and worshiping, uh, but you feel isolated and alone. And so those wings of the triangle are spread way out because you don't know where they are. Or maybe, maybe those are in because you have really good connections with the people around you, but you have a really hard time getting into the scripture and prayer and, and asking the question, God, what are you speaking into my life today? We're all in different seasons and we can all draw different, uh, different triangles. And in your sermon notes, there's a space for you to draw your own triangle. What does it look like for you? And I say this not as a, a means of guilt or shame, right? Because we all have our own shape that we would put in that space. But I think as we have self-awareness of what it is and how we're following Christ. So he says, follow me. And we're leaning into that. If we have an awareness of where we are, I think God speaks into that. And he says, hey, let me help you find connection. Let me help you as you go and bless the world. Let me help you know your identity in me. And so all of this stems from Jesus going to Levi and saying, Follow me. Come, come and learn. Come and see. Come and do. And as we take that all in, as we think about what it means to be a disciple, becoming and belonging and blessing, we all do it in light of Jesus' words. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He knows that our triangles and our shapes sometimes look a lot more selfish than they should. That's not a surprise. That's not something he scratches his head and says, uh, what's going on? No, in that moment, he says, guess what? You're loved. Let me help you. You are forgiven. I'm here for you. And so as we look at what it means to be a disciple, as we look at the pathway that we're on, we have something to strive for. Learning from Jesus and how he taught his disciples. But we also know that he came for us. Where we're at. He came to, to the fishermen. He came to Levi. He comes to us. Where we're at. To help us know. He's always going to be there. There's nothing that takes us too far from him. And as we learn from him, we get closer and closer. We become more connected to who he is and what he'd have for our lives. And that is an amazing place to be. So as we go from here, 
my hope is that you can reflect on what it means to be his disciple. You can see areas where he might be speaking into your life and saying, hey, maybe, maybe we could work on this. Maybe uh, this is something that I'm asking you to do. All the while knowing, no matter what happens, you are loved and you are forgiven. Because I've not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he proves that as he goes to the cross. He proves it with an empty tomb. He proves that following him takes us into a place of having hope. No matter where we're at in our journey or what season we're in. We have hope because of what he's done for us. Amen? Amen. Amen.